Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, always known as Forum BX257, your friendly neighborhood 1980s and 90s GI Joe tour reviewer. And this month marks my 10th anniversary on YouTube. So in order to thank you, I want you to ask me some questions. Now, I started this way back in my uh, beginning of year update video. So I took questions from there. And I'm not going to be answering some of the more personal questions because this isn't an AMA and we're not on Reddit. So I don't have to if I don't want to. But I'll probably get a bit personal anyway because that's just my nature. Now I want to well basically introduce myself a bit properly because I'm sure that there are at least a few viewers who don't really know me as such. Now the the first thing you're probably asking is, why Form BX257? What does that mean? Now, I got that name from the cartoons. In the 1983 five-part miniseries done by Sunbow Animation, um, G.I. Joe, a real American hero, or better known as G.I. Joe, the mass device, the Baroness is in disguise as an army major. And she's at a base um, trying to just confuse an army general who is there with Duke, and he wants Duke in order to test his um, defenses of his base. But the Baroness is trying to convince the General that um, he hasn't gone through the proper channels in order to activate the G.I. Joe team in order to do this. So she says that he needed to fill out Form BX257, and there's a rest of that conversation. But that's basically where it came from initially. Now, I have been collecting G.I. Joes from the very early 90s, and back then there was no eBay, and there was absolutely uh, no Google or anything like that. So, uh, one of the things we had to do in order to get information was either to go through books, which were sometimes a little bit self-serving because many books were also a value guide, so mm, some of the information was not particularly, well, fully correct, let's just say. And there were also electronic bulletin boards and personal websites. And I had joined a bulletin board and called myself Form BX257 because uh, when you're, you're when you're making handles for like bulletin boards, it's usually uh, the format to have like names and numbers and things like that. So Form BX257 fit in very well, and I had kept that for uh, well longer than the bulletin board was even up. I think it was per it was actually a Canadian bulletin board, if you didn't know, I am a Canadian collector. 80% of my collection is from the US, but you know, 20% is here locally. It's just easier to get American items quickly. Uh, the Canadian toy market is quite a bit uh, slower than um, the American one after all. But when I joined um, YouTube in 2007, two years before I started to make my own videos, I went and just made, well, I'll just keep Form BX257 and make the Canadian flag point, the one Canadian flag point, my avatar, and I've kept it ever since. So how do I choose what I want to add to my collection? Now, you have to understand that um, my primary focus in, 19, in the early 1990s, when I first started up, was to collect everything from 1982 through 1985. To me, those were the prime years. I was very uh, aware of G.I. Joe when it first came to Canada in 1982, and 1985 was pretty much the last time I had actually ever bought a toy. It was kind of going out of buying toys and into other things. So to me, those were very prime years, and I want everything in there. I want a complete collection. I was basically a completionist, which is a very, uh, a very 90s thing, a very, uh, I guess, um, speculative market type of a thing to do. But that was very common in the 1990s. It's not so common now. A lot of, a lot of big collectors really don't care about you know, packaging and conditions, things like that. They, they really more just care about you know, the toys and the history, which is pretty much the best attitude to actually have, really. So to say that I have 1982 through 85 absolutely covered is a very particular uh, thing to do because that those are the most expensive toys in the G.I. Joe line. And the G.I. Joe line, while very big, is also a, a very finite amount of toys. 1982 through 1994, you can find any type of um, uh, collection guide and identification guide and things like that where it shows you exactly you know how much 
toys there were and what they looked like and what they did. So uh, you look look through those things. Mark Belomo's Ultimate Guide is a very good example of this. I think it's one of the best visual guide examples. There are also online places like um, Yojo, uh, yojo.com. That's a, a very good identification to see what you know what's in the collection what might be of interest to you and when I look at stuff from the 90s I'm not exactly uh, um, very pleased with the photos so I go to toy conventions and toy shows and things like that places where you know 80s nostalgia and 80s toys might be sold and I look and physically look at the toys themselves now this 1991 Badger is a very good example of how I go further into that and that is I usually buy toy lots like just a whole bunch of figures and accessories and they're all jumbled up and they may need repair and things like that just just job lots of toys and sometimes I get accessories for toys that I don't have now that's what happened with this I saw this um, and it was missing the missiles and it was very cheap because of that now of course the Badger is very bright, it's kind of obnoxious looking, but I went and actually handled one and I thought, you know what, this is actually a fairly good toy, despite its coloration. It was missing its missiles, bought it for cheap, added the missiles because I actually had them, um, you know, in my job lot, and now I have a complete one for very cheap. Now, if I don't really like this, I haven't spent a lot on it and I can either sell it or give it away. So just what did happen to my modern version of Footloose, where I used them as an example of whether or not modern figures could fit into vintage vehicles. Well, Footloose is right here today because he is actually not my figure. He is actually my cousin's figure who has some of these modern figures. And he was actually part of a three pack from uh, Rise of Cobra. I think it was a Target exclusive or something like that. And he wanted it back over, actually over Christmas, so it was kind of a while back. Um, so I gave it back to him and he was like, well, he had it in the display for like a month and then he gave it back to me. Um, honestly, I kind of forgot to put him in some of the segments for um, uh, an example of whether or not these types of figures will fit in here. I think Footloose here is a very good example of a modern figure because he's actually rather tall. He wears a helmet and he's actually kind of bulky. What I had planned on doing when he had asked me for the figure back for his display, I was like, you know what? I should just make one long video of just me putting a modern figure in vintage vehicles. Just, you know, rather than having uh, like this segment, which I may or may not forget to put in. So that's what happened with Footloose and he will get his completely own separate video one of these days. Now, what do I think of modern figures? I don't collect them because I want to collect the vintage figures. I, I don't think that they go together very well, even though like modern figures have modern articulation and that's great and all, but the feel of 1980s and 90s figures is very different from something that was made from a, like basically from 2000 on onwards. They have this sort of um, vinyl feel to them, which uh, I don't really connect very well with and honestly despite the fact that there are some improvements to some of these modern versions of vintage characters honestly um, I don't want to recollect a whole bunch of the same characters it's one of the reasons why I don't really buy a lot of these sub team figures because to me it's like buying the same figure over again and why would I want to do that I like the vintage figures they're, they're not exactly perfect, but they're honest to their era. So how much is my collection worth? Well, isn't that the million dollar question? And I actually do have a very unfortunate answer for you. Unfortunate for me because, well, I have an insurance quote for what my collection is worth, and that is about $7,500 to $8,500. It's a, kind of a bracket. But one thing is for certain that I think my collection is actually worth more than the insurance quote. The insurance quote is just uh, the minimum amount that you would have to pay in order to replace everything that I have. So what do I have? And that is 1982 through 1985 figures all sealed on their cards. 
I have those same figures, both loose, and some like variations of those figures loose. I have all the vehicles and playsets from 1982 through 85. Those are those all have their packaging. Very few of them are unassembled and like mint and packaged, but quite a few of them actually have the drivers still sealed in their bubbles. I usually have du duplicates of the drivers just to go along with assembled uh, vehicles, which just happen to have their packaging. Also have a lot of store exclusive. Uh, most of the ones from 1982 through 85, both in the US and Canadian versions of those exclusives. So that's, that's quite a bit of the chunk of the value right there. I have all of 1986 loose, both figures and vehicles. And I would actually consider part of, um, part of that quote, uh, some of the stuff from 1987 through like the 90s that is particularly rare and valuable, like the Star Duster figure and Steel Brigade figures are actually kind of uh, high up there in the value. So I include those in the insurance range. However, if I were to sell these individually, I would probably get well over 10 grand for that. If you have a collection that is, you know, that valuable somewhere closer or to, or to approaching something like 10 grand, you should probably have insurance on it. And I have insurance, which is actually separate from my house insurance. Unfortunately, I can't really give you a quote because that insurance, num the actual insurance that I'm paying is actually combined with my wife's. So she has her own collectibles and uh, jewelry and stuff like that, which is in there. And that would kind of skew the amount really. Which of course raises another question. How much did I actually pay for all of this? Well, I am still sort of still paying for this because I am still sort of collecting, but I think most of the massive amounts of um, dollars uh, is a kind of behind me because quite frankly, a lot of the stuff that I'm buying now is from the late 80s, early 90s and really doesn't go for very much. This example was Duke here and I probably bought him for like $75 back in like 95 or 96 or something like that, I probably paid way more than what the insurance uh, quote is, but certainly less than what I would consider, you know, the whole collection to be worth if I were to sell it individually. Now this has become kind of an unfortunate hot topic here on YouTube, um, not only because I consider myself to be primarily a toy channel, and open to all ages. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, YouTube's policy towards toy channels has become quite a bit stricter and almost draconian in nature. And on top of this, I also talk about real world firearms, which is something YouTube has already uh, s sort of come down on. A lot of firearms channels in the past have actually you know, gone out or, or have been stopped monetizing and stuff like that. And that's rather unfortunate because I am like many of those firearms channels, trying to be educational about firearms. Now, granted, I just show pictures and try to compare them to what the toys, GI Joes, are trying to replicate. Um, but this is a very worrying development, so I don't really want to talk about too much about real-world firearms, even though that is something that I collect. Now, when I first um, talked about this, I was talking about the J.I. Joe's not only not being my only hobby. And in the early 90s, I was collecting firearms as well. Um, that is a community which I actually got out of. So for a while, I had actually sold all of my firearms. And I was collecting firearms, not because of like home defense or anything. Um, I was collecting historical firearms or things that are significant in their um, technological development. Much of my you know, handgun knowledge kind of ends in the 90s. But recently I've reconnected with some of my friends in the um, uh, firearms community and I'm actually gotten back into it. And you know, I'm having a bit of fun there. So there's a, one of my favorite little items here. If you don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell you. And if you do know what it is, cool on you, bro. YouTube doesn't really want me to talk about firearms anymore, so I guess I won't. I have tried to get my videos off of YouTube for quite a while. I've tried Blip TV, I've tried Daily Motion. Nobody wants, the, the audience, the viewership doesn't want to go over to a different format. I kind of understand that, but honestly, I think a lot of toy uh, related channels in the future are going to be, well, they're going to be hurt 
by YouTube's own policies in the upcoming future, very, very soon upcoming future. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can go on to Michael French's video on retro blasting. He talks about that. Um, basically, YouTube, like he says, basically YouTube is treating its audience like little children. Uh, it's um, becoming kind of a, a nanny state type of a video platform, and that, um, that, that's not good for longevity. So will I ever do videos on sub-teams like Night Force, Tiger Force, Python Patrol, and Slaughter's Marauders? Absolutely yes. Yes, I will. And I will also include the um, UK and South American variants of those in my information. However, I won't be doing them in the regular format. I will actually be doing them in the same format that I do the 50th anniversary videos, where it's basically just a picture, a very well detailed picture at that, but you know, it'll just be my dialogue over a photo, really. Um, one of the reasons why I don't really want to buy this stuff is because for the most part, these sub teams are just remolds of existing toys, and all of which in those four lines I already have. Now, I will admit that um, <laughs> I got this idea way back when I was doing my first Night Force video where those were the actual toys that I was handling around, but those weren't actually my toys. I wasn't even filming at my house. Those were my cousin at his house when I was visiting. It was actually kind of a surprise to me that he had the entire line of um, the second series of Night Force figures, which of course led a lot of commenters to ask, well, where's the first series? What about the vehicles and things like that? Well, those are things that I can't answer because, well, he, he had what he had, and I was lucky enough, you know, to be able to actually do that video. One or two people have actually asked me to uh, talk about the watch, which I'm almost always wearing in these videos. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I actually don't wear this uh, watch really all that much nowadays because, well, the all seal band doesn't really go with the more casual uh, clothes that I wear nowadays. Uh, I used to be a bit more formal in my wear, working on office after all, but you, you know, styles change, trends change, and I'm now wearing, like a lot of people in the office, more casual clothes. And an all steel bracelet doesn't really go very well with that, so I'm looking to replace this with something with more of like a black leather band or something like that. But I still wear it because it's actually fairly easy to remind myself where my hand is in the framework of the LCD display on my camera. So here's a tiny little mini review. This is a Bulova style 98B111 per their Marine Star line. The Marine Star line was pretty much their basic sport line of watches. And this was actually the basic one of the basic line. So this didn't really have a lot of fancy features, but it's still a Bulova and has really great quality. And the, um, the features it did have were across the whole line. Now, one thing that this has is like a movable um, bezel ring. So even though there's not a lot to grip here, which is rather unfortunate, you can still move the, uh, the ring. It still ratchets and it moves in a counterclockwise motion only. On top of that, most of the Marine Star lines had these long clasps with this uh, fold over and push in to unlock lock clasp. It's not something which a lot of Bulovas have nowadays. They have this like this split clasp, which I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't look right to me, but I'm more used to this style of clasp. This style also hides something. The diver's extension, go like that, and an extra links worth of length is added to the bracelet instantly. So now you can just put this back together and you have this extra length and now this thing will fit over your, uh, well, it's meant to fit over a scuba diver's sleeve, but you can also put it over your sweater or if you just want more air between your skin and the, uh, the metal links, that's one of the reasons why I use it because sometimes if I, my arms are wet, I want a bit of air between that. I don't want it so close. So having that extra length actually helps. Um, as you can see, my arms are actually very hairy. So, you know, I'm very sensitive to poor quality metal links. And Bulovas have traditionally always been very good quality when it comes to that. 
Now, these are not like made in some fancy country. The, it, Bolova used to be an American company, but most of their stuff is actually made in Japan under, I think, the Citizen brand. But it's still really high quality and it certainly deserves the price. They look great. Um, here's the original box here. And it comes with like a little, little below of a pillow here. So you can just put it back on there. Before I put this thing away permanently, I'll probably just clean it because, I, like I said, I've been wearing this thing on and off for uh, almost 10 years now. It's a 10 year old design. But uh, yeah, it still looks great. And it'll look great in a display case as well. I think I've mentioned it before, but I don't really want to do a review of the live action movies. Here I have them on Blu-ray and well, they're both not really good movies, especially when you consider um, things like G.I. Joe Resolute and maybe even condensed forms of the G.I. Joe old cartoons. They're, they're actually kind of better than these live action multi-million dollar efforts. Now, G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra has the exact opposite faults to G.I. Joe uh, Retaliation. I feel that the writing in G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra is actually really good, but the direction is terrible. The direction is responsible for the movie being so, well, dark and slow, despite having really good dialogue and really good ideas. The opposite is true of this. G.I. Joe Retaliation is, well, very, very well directed. I mean, the action sequences and how you get from point A to point B is really, really quick and everything is very energetic. I really love, you know, um, The Rock here. I don't think he makes a very good roadblock, but I still like the actor himself anyway. But the writing is terrible. I don't understand what Cobra's motivation is in this. It makes no sense. It's like they have two plots going on at the same time. Honestly, yeah, the, the, the efforts of these two movies is, is not really good. I guess maybe that's your review if you, if you want to count it as that. You know, I think the only good thing about this Blu-ray for retaliation is the, uh, the free dog tags, which I actually sent away for and got. So that was actually kind of neat. And that was pretty much the, the best things out of these movies, unfortunately. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Thank you for being a part of this 10th anniversary special. It is you, the viewers, and the fantastic G.I. Joe community, which has actually spurred me on to make bigger and better videos over the course of all this time. I wanted to say thanks for over 10,000 subscribers, but by the time that this video has come up, it's well over 11,000 now. So absolutely, thank you. It is you that have put me here, and I want to give back to you as much as I possibly can by making the best videos that I possibly can. See you later, and yo Joe.